Alrighty, so integrated development environment. That's what we got with Visual Studio. Called an integrated development environment because it mixes your text editor, your code writer, and your compilation and linking tools and a debugger. Now the debugger is really awesome and we ought to have like just two hours where we sit down and I zoom with you individually and make each one of you debug a broken program. I'm not sure how to work that into our agenda. But I'm going to go ahead and make a new project for today. So I launched Visual Studio. If you've got Visual Studio launched and you want to play along, that's cool. You don't got to. So let's see here. So I'm going to create a new project. Whoops. It could show all the options. The specific options that I want is I want it to be a console application. So from this little pull down here, I can choose console. It definitely needs to be Windows. I'd like for it to be C++. So C++, Windows, console. And that's what we want is the console application right there. Or we could do an empty project. An empty project works just as well as starting a console app. If we do the console app, it goes ahead and it fills in the, uh, here, I'll show you the difference. I'm going to choose empty project. I'm not going to give it a good name because I'm going to recreate it in just a minute. Now this is how I used to have it. People do it every single time because he, well, won't even get into why. But Visual Studio loads up, and then I have my Solution Explorer over here. And if I wanted to get started, I would need to right-click and do Add New Item and pick a CPP file, a C++ file. And so I would choose a C++ CPP file, and then I would type in my stuff. Right, pound sign include this, that, and the other, and then you know, public or no, excuse me, into main. I'm not going to do the whole thing, right? Like that, and then I could get going. Well, fortunately, I can just choose um, that console app instead, and it goes ahead and it fills it in with me, and I get some extra comments here that I then have to delete, but I don't have to type all that stuff in to begin with. So I like that. So if you're using Visual Studio, you may as well do it that way. Either way works. Okay, so I want a console app. I'm just gonna call this Lecture B because that's what we're on. And it gives us some little useful information, kind of a you are here map, like in a mall. This file contains the main function. Every program you write will have a main function. Depending upon what platform, what framework you're building, it might have a funny name, like an uppercase M rather than a lowercase M, or it might start off with an underscore or something like that. But when you let it create it, you can go ahead and accept that what it's creating is correct. And so then it tells you how to run the program. To start without debugging or to start with debugging. Well, what is that? What is debugging? Let me, uh, I'm going to just type in some stuff here. You certainly don't have to type this because this is just to get some stuff going on here. All right, so what does this program do? It creates a variable called i, excuse me. Creates a variable called i, which can hold an integer number, and the integer number is a whole number. It stores, sets that value equal to one, sets that variable equal to what the value one, and then it adds one to it. That plus plus is called increment. It increments it by one. I do need to get rid of this because then it multiplies itself by 10. 
So it's going to change from one to two and then two to 20. And then it prints it out to the screen. That's what C out does. Now I don't particularly like having to put STD colon colon in front of everything. So I'm going to add this line to my code using STD, excuse me, using namespace STD. And then I can get rid of that STD colon colon business because this says you don't need to do that. I understand where you're pulling those from. We'll talk more about that. All righty. So, and then if I run it, it goes ahead and compiles it. It runs the preprocessor, it runs the linker, it generates an executable, and then it runs that exe file. And it will display the answer 20. All right, so that's the debugger. Well, big deal, right? But what's interesting about the debugger is that you can do what's called setting a breakpoint. And if you set a breakpoint, it tells the program to stop at that particular point, and then you can trace the program. So I'm going to set a breakpoint right here. I just clicked on this gray margin, and it set a breakpoint. I don't know what that is. All right. And so now when I run the debugger, it goes ahead and it starts running the program, but then it stops here. And so I can hold my cursor over the value, the letter I, and it shows me what I is currently set to. Well, you probably can't see that, but it shows it being set to like negative 85 billion or something like that. It's got some garbage value stored in it because it hasn't been initialized yet. This line created a variable, but it didn't store value into it. So it's just got some random bytes that happen to be stored at that memory location. But that's what this line is trying to do. We're trying to assign using the so-called assignment operator. We're just setting i equal to one. And so as soon as this line executes, that value of i is going to change to where it's no longer negative 85 billion or whatever it is. If I pull this up, I should be able to see a list of all my variables. Fine print, but there it says i set to negative 85 million billion, whatever that is, I'm gonna let it skip, execute this line. And I do that with these little arrows over here. There's four little arrows. There's this one which says step into, I'm gonna skip that one, I'm not gonna do that. And then there's one called step over. Step over actually means go to the next line. And that's what I wanted to do. So it just ran that line. And the value of I changed to one. So if I hover my cursor over the I, and now that is no longer ne negative 87 million, it's equal to one. So I'm going to step over again, run the next line. That plus plus changed that one to a two. So the value of I changed from one to two. And so what's this gonna do? It's gonna multiply it by 10. Times equals 10 means take I, multiply it by 10 and store it back into I. Just like if you've done uh, Python, you needed plus equals one, plus equals one, added one to it, times equal 10, multiplies it by 10. So I'm gonna do a step over, let it execute that line. And now I has changed from being two to 20. And it hasn't printed anything on the screen yet. So if I go back here, my screen is still blank. But if I do one more step over, now it has displayed it on the screen. It executed that line, I can go and look, and there it is, there's my 20, it printed it out to the screen. So that is the interactive debugger. Very, very quick introduction to it, but debugging is incredibly useful. The better of a programmer you become, the more often you'll use the debugger and vice versa. So you can figure out logic errors by stepping through your program and watching the data change. You go, oh, well, that's why it's not you know, being set to this. It's because my formula is wrong. Or, oh, my if statement was wrong, so it didn't execute the else, or whatever. When I'm done debugging, I can just press this red little stop debugging message button here. Right? Now it's gone. All right, so that was just a little program that set I and then printed out the value 20. That's all. And it's using the integrated development environment. I'm gonna remove the breakpoint because it'll keep stopping there every time I run it until that breakpoint is gone. So I'm gonna stop the debugger, clicking the red that, and 
the Mac users, Xcode has the same functionality. It's just displayed differently, of course. But you can Google up, or if you need me to find you one, a, a tutorial on how to use a debugger in Xcode for a C++ application, I'll be happy to do that for you. So I just clicked on it again to remove the breakpoint. The red stop sign's gone. We ought to be good to go. So here's a program. How many hours did you work? Let them type it in. How much did you get paid per hour? Let them type it in. Calculate the pay and display the pay. And you have earned that much money. All right. Now, as we mentioned last time, this does not do time and a half, right? So you're not getting extra credit for working for more than 40 hours a week, but that's the way they wrote the program. Slightly older version of Visual Studio but the interface really is pretty much the same, huh? What is a program made of? Sugar and spice and everything nice? Don't know. Let's go look. Common elements of programming languages. Keywords. The keywords are things like if, else, for, using. And the editor tries to colorize things to make things easy to spot. The keywords are blue. Now I can probably configure the editor by going into tools. I forget if it's customize or options. Okay. I love that you have both a customize and an options choice. I never remember which is hidden under which. But anyways, fonts and colors. I could go in here and I could say that I want keywords to not be blue, but I want them to be something else. So keywords, I want keywords to be in bold. I want them really to leap out. Okay, and now they are, right? So those are all the keywords. Well, how come that's not a keyword? Well, we talked about that. That's a preprocessor directive. Preprocessor is not part of the C or C++ language. It's just that the people who invented the C++ language also invented the C processor. It's its own language. And when we did that, uh, I'm going to pound sign define, you know, the word begin to be the opening brace so that I could put the word begin there if I wanted to. Remember when we did that? I'm going to undo that. But anyways, these are preprocessor commands. You could use a preprocessor in any programming language that decided to add support for it, but unfortunately, C++ seems to be the one that does that. Anyways, I'm going to undo that change. So that is a different thing than a keyword, but it is a preprocessor command. And there are quite a few of them. If I type in pound sign, the editor comes up with a whole bunch of them, like if and if def. You can, ah, I'm not gonna even get into it. There's about 20 of them. I don't know what that one does, using. I have to figure that out. Okay, so I'm, going to add a couple of things to what I consider my standard boilerplate. As a matter of fact, I think I have a document called boilerplate and I'm going to go and take a look at it. This is stuff that you'll wind up adding to your code over and over. So for example, if I want to use the power function two to the power of three, I need to use the POW function. Well, Microsoft brings it in by default, but the Mac users don't get it by default and they have to do pound sign include C math to get it. And then there are other math functions, of course, in there as well, not just the power of function and also strings. So pretty much every time I create a file, I'm gonna want this as part of my opening block of code. So all I did is go to modules, class information, grab the boilerplate, and I highlight those first lines and I'm gonna copy and paste them into my code. I don't 
know why it's underlined that. Anyways, that didn't change the way the program worked, but it sets it up so that if I want to take something to the power of something else, I can do that, right? So I think I'll delete these lines. I don't see any reason to keep them around, but int x is equal to 10, and then x is equal to POW of x to the power of two. So it's gonna square itself. This POW function is one of the things that gets brought in by CMath. Although, like I said, Microsoft's C implementation is slightly non-standard and they give it to you anyways without even having to do this pound sign include CMath. But that's not true for every version of C++. And what does this use math defines? Let's Google that up. Google is our friend. Gives us constants. Specifically pi, right? M underscore pi so that we can get 3.14159, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also got other ones in there. The square root of two. Pi divided by four, pi divided by two. <laughs> the log of two, the log base 10. Anyways, I usually just use it to get a hold of pi because I tend to, for some reason, keep wanting to calculate the, the area of a circle and stuff like that. So those are keywords. And then the programmer defined identifiers. These are the things that we get to pick. This is a programmer, this, that's an identifier. So is that, it's a variable name. So variables are identifier, functions are identifiers, class names, once we start talking about classes are identifiers, it's just we get to pick it up and we can call these things anything we want to within the limitation of the fact that our program has to have a main method but everything else we can pick this name this variable does not have to be called x it could be called fred and as long as we refer to it fred everywhere the program will work just as well as it did before you know i want to display that variable to the screen that'll do it right but I, you will hear me say this periodically. I will say variable names aren't important or variable main names don't mean anything to the computer. And what I mean by that is we pick them. We get to pick them to our, for our own purpose. The computer doesn't care whether that was called Fred or whether it was called three underscores, which looks ludicrous, right? But it's valid code. Although it's calling it an error. Maybe it's not valid code. Oh, I think I have too many of them. I have, think I have one more there than I wanted to. Yeah. All right. How about that? I could make one variable that was one underscore, one variable that was two, one variable that was three. This is kind of the most ridiculous thing that I can imagine unless I was gonna make a variable name that was 80 characters long, right? I could do that as well. It's just it got a name so that it can we can use that name to refer to data. And as long as I remember what that name is, I'm good to go. Variable names matter only to people. So I try to pick good variable names because they mean something to me, but the computer doesn't care. You know, I could call this I hate programming, and the computer will run it just as good well as if I'd called it X or anything else. Now I'm gonna undo that obviously because that's bizarre, but as long as that variable has been created, you can go ahead and use it. It's the names are important to the people who write the code and to the people who read the code. The computer doesn't care. That doesn't mean we don't want to pick good names. It means that the computer is not making us pick names. We get to pick the names that we want. And so we make the names fit our purposes and, and our preferences. And then there are operators. Operators are the symbols. That's an operator. Less than, less than is an operator. X equals X times two plus three. Plus is an operator. Asterisk is an operator. All of those are operators.
punctuation. Punctuation are the things like semicolons at the, after the end of a statement. And then the syntax. The syntax is the grammar that the language has to follow, the, the, that the commands have to follow in order to be considered valid language. So for example, in uh, English, the adjective precedes the noun. That's just English. Now in French and in Spanish, the adjective follows the noun. Now I don't know French or Spanish for, so El Tractor Rojo, right? The adjective is following the noun. Now if you walk up to me and say, where is the tractor red? I'll probably understand you, right? And so if I walk up to a Spanish speaking person and I was using the correct word, not tractor, right? El Rojo tractor, if I got the syntax wrong, they'd have a good chance of understanding me anyways, even though I wasn't speaking the language correctly. That's because humans are brilliant. Our brains, you know, you know, are perfectly fine tuned for understanding languages and all of its vagarities, but computers are not. Computer syntax needs to follow the rules specifically. And so one of the rules of the language is that if you have a plus sign, there better be something on both sides of it. If I do this, x equals three plus, that's a syntax error. Because three plus what, right? Algebraically, I need something on the other side of it as well. So it's, it's a syntax error to be missing something on that side of it. And so syntax is just the rules that the language has, that uh, your code has to follow. And that's what we're learning. And most of y'all already know Python's programming syntax and C++ is just it's the same in a lot of ways and it's different in other ways, right? You certainly did not have these guys in Python, but you certainly did have equals and asterisks and pluses. You didn't have semicolons, but whatever. In Python, you did not give your date, your variables a type when you declared them. You just would say x equals 10, but you know, Syntactically, you're gonna be recognizing what you're gonna write, even though it is different. It's just a different syntax. So keywords, also are known as reserved words. These are words that we can't use as variable names. I can't create a variable called int, right? I can't say, okay, I'm gonna make a new variable called int. No, it's, it's a reserved word, I can't do that, you know, or the word C-H-A-R. Whenever you type it, if it turns a color like that, that means that you can't use it as an identifier, you can't use it as your own variable name because it's already predefined. It's a quick way, whoops. The language has about 70 reserved words in it. So using, namespace, int, double, return, those are all keywords. Programmer-defined identifiers. Those are names that are made up by the programmer. So they're not part of the language. And if I didn't speak English, I wouldn't use English as my variable names. I might be you know, using Russian variable names or whatever. Used to represent various things, the variables, which are memory locations, and the function names. And so in that program we're looking at in the PowerPoint, hours and rate and pay are variables. So those are identifiers. And there are rules that you have to follow in order to get good variable names. And they are the same rules that are pretty much that they were in Python. So your variable names and your function names, because they are both identifiers. I'm gonna tack some notes down in here. Identifiers can be letters, underscores, and digits. No spaces, an identifier can only be one word long, I can't say my age equals three, right? That'd be a syntax error. 
So cannot begin with a digit. Uppercase and lowercase are distinct, so they are case sensitive. Yeah, that's about it. So, you know, my space age equals three. That's not a, that's an invalid. My age like that, that is valid, right? That's a valid identifier because there's nothing illegal about it. You know, tax rate for 2020 equals like that, right? That's valid. But it can't begin with a digit. So if I try to reverse it, right? 2020 tax rate. That's invalid. And we could prove that if I was actually in the code, right? If I went up here and I tried to create variables with those names, right? So int my age equals, I'm going to pretend that I'm young. Yeah, right. I'm 53. So that's how old I am. That worked. But if I put a space in there, whatever, that wouldn't work. Or I could have called it, you know, my age with an underscore. This is a more modern naming convention. A lot of people use it now. It's called camel case. Camel because it's got a hump in the middle. I didn't make that up. Some person gave this the ludicrous name of snake case because the underscores made them look like snakes. That, that's absurd. But, you know, that's actually how I learned how to program in the 70s. Uh, underscores were common. Nowadays, people do it like this. But I use underscores because if I do something like this, if I say double tax rate equals 0 0.20, and then I start typing tax rate equals 4, whatever, if you're trying to follow along with me, this is going to require you to get my uppers and lowers exactly right, right? You're going to have to remember that I made that R, an uppercase R, and so on. And so generally, I use all lowercase letters for my variable names. Just, just when I'm, you know, not when I'm doing professional programming. If I'm doing professional programming, since this is the modern standard, I would probably do that. But when I'm teaching to students and I'm hoping that people are going to be typing along, I do all lowercase. And so I separate my words with underscores. It looks old fashioned. People think that you, you, know, you were programming in the 70s or 80s if you do it that way. But whatever. So double tax rate 2020 is equal to 0 0.20. That's valid. Double 2020 tax rate equals 0 0.20. Is that valid? No, it's going to underline that. That is invalid. Can't begin with a digit. Int my age equals 53. That's going to be a syntax error because you can't use the space as part of your variable name. It thinks it's two tokens now rather than just one, right? It thinks it's two things. So no spaces in identifiers. Now, I don't remember if this book says uh, underscores are valid variable names or not. They are. If you wanted to, double salary dollar sign is equal to 30,000, right? Like that. That is a valid variable name, but I'm not sure it's valid for all versions of C++. I don't know if it's just a quirk that it works in C++ or not. I mean, it for on Microsoft's compilers or not. If you've used the basic programming language, then you use dollar signs perhaps to represent strings. I would just leave them off. I would never use a dollar sign in, in a programming language that actually did not mandate it. Looks kind of weird. Also, it's kind of cool. But anyways, it's non-standard. So even if the book, if the book says it's invalid, then go, yeah, well, you know, it is kind of valid sometimes, but we'll see. Get rid of that. Don't use dollar signs, although it is valid in Microsoft Studio, Microsoft Visual C Studio. So the operators perform manipulations on data. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. 
These are called the stream insertion operators. That's a funny term, but it redirects whatever's after it to the stream, to the output stream, to display something on the screen. That's what less and less than does. And what greater than greater than does is it takes something from the input stream and stores it in a variable. So C out, less and less than how many hours did you work? Sends that to the out, the console output. And then CIN greater than greater than whatever the user types in comes in through the so-called input stream. And so these are the stream operators that takes the data from that input and stores it in that variable. And then punctuation. Commas that are part of a parameter list. Right, when I took X to the power of two or three or whatever, I had a comma in there. I don't remember if I deleted that or not. Yeah, right there, right? So that's punctuation. You separate your arguments or your parameters with commas. You end a statement with semicolon. That does not mean that you put a semicolon on each and every line. You don't put one there. Don't put one there. <laughs> a good rule of thumb is, is that every line does need a semicolon unless, unless the next line is an open brace. So that would be why we don't do that. And that rule comes into play a, a lot. If you see things like an if statement, if my underscore age is greater than zero, and then you have a curly brace to start some kind of block of code, see out. Yeah. If my age is greater than 30, wow, you're old. I'm being sarcastic. All right, there you go. So, this marks off a block of code that is subordinate to the if statement. This block of code will only happen if this if statement is true. You never put a semicolon in front of an opening curly brace because it kind of just disables it. If I did that, if I accidentally put my semicolon there, then it's going to print, wow, you're old, no matter what. If I set my age equal to one, it's still going to print, wow, you're old, because this completely short circuits that if statement. It's an effect saying, if my age is greater than 30, how's about doing nothing? And then, oh, then go ahead and just do this as a matter of course, regardless of whether this was true or not. So you will see tech, um, there's more than one way of formatting your code and where you put your braces. And a lot of people and a lot of code editors default to this mode, to where your curly brace is on the same line as the if statement before it. And at least, it's trying to help me format. Oh, come on, stop it. I cannot get it to let me type it. It's, it's trying to fix it for me. Okay, anyways, that would make abundantly clear, right? That there should not be a semicolon there after your if statement because the curly brace is there right on the same line with it and that just flat out looks wrong. So doing it this way where the, cur where the braces line up like that is called block brace style. And it's, it's a very popular one, but the other one is when the curly brace is pushed up to the line above it. Like that. And a lot of people do that as well. So you'll see it either way. I happen to like the block placement. So even though it takes up a little bit more space on the screen, I can't get quite as many lines of code on the screen because you know each time I have an open brace, I hit return on it. I think it's worth it just in the way the code looks so that you can see these braces lining up. So the syntax of the rules of grammar that must be followed when writing the program. It dictates the use of the keywords and the operators and the programmer defined symbols and punctuation. And so variable, a variable is a named storage location for holding data. In that program clip they show, there's three variables. There's hours and then there's rate and then there's pay. I'm gonna give a slightly more sophisticated definition of a variable. A variable is a named location in memory. Every variable has four things. 
got a name, its identifier, it's got a type, it's got a value, and it's got an address in memory. Now, the most programming languages, you have no control over the address. The, uh, the language, when it runs, the operating system and the program pick the address where your memory is stored. You don't have any access to it by memory. You have to get a hold of it by the identifier's name. C++, though, since it goes back to C, kind of exists on a nebulous middle lower plane between doing assembly language programming and high level programming. You can actually access things by address. For example, if I was curious about what byte this tax rate variable was stored in, I could find out by using a specific operator. So C out less than less than tax rate address is end quote less than less than ampersand tax rate ampersand NDL. And I'm going to do the same thing for tax rate 2020 because those are two different variables and they can have two different values or they could have the same value. It's just coincidence that they have the same value, right? Because one could have been 0.2 and one could have been 0.3. So tax rate 2020 address is, and so the ampersand here means the memory address. Tell me what memory address that variable is stored at. And so when we run it, it's going to print it out. Normally we don't care, but you could write programs that do care. And so the memory address where that tax rate variable is stored is that. And this is hexadecimal, so it doesn't look you know, like a number to us, but it is. It's the hexadecimal of the digits zero through nine plus six additional digits represented by the letters A, B, C, D, E, and F. And then the other variable's address is different, of course. If they had the same memory address, that would mean that they were the same variable, and they're not. So every variable has a name, and it has a type, and it has a value, and it has an address. Now the type are things like int, and double, and string, and character. The type determines what kind of values can be stored in that variable. Whole numbers can go into ints. However, fractional values like 0.2 cannot go into ints. It would just round it down to zero if we tried. So we need a floating point type if we want to hold a zero, you know, a number with a decimal point or something expressed in scientific notation. So for numbers, that are not whole numbers, you're gonna wind up using the double. Double is a floating point type that supports decimal points. So our other special characters valid. We would have to just try them and see Most special characters are actually operators. So like I can't use a parentheses as part of a variable name. I don't know what would happen if you tried using, um, you know how you can hold down the alt key in your numeric keypad and you can type in special symbols like, you know, hearts and smiley faces and boxes and stuff like that. I think that if you were using an editor that supported Unicode, that you could use all sorts of special characters as your variable names, but I'm not absolutely sure that that's the case. But it would need to do that in order to support like, I'm trying to figure out how to get like an O with a, uh, an umlaut on it, right? And it's not working. Hmm, 
how do I do that? All right, so now I have an O with an umlaut. Let me go and paste that into my program, just out of curiosity. Ant. I think it's gonna work. Well, did it work or not? Or did I get an, any? I didn't get an error message about it. Yeah, yeah, it worked just fine. Okay, so. You can certainly use non simple English letters as part of your variables names. However, it's going to frustrate other people who are trying to edit your code, <laughs> right? So I would make it as standard as possible. Um, you just have to check to see whatever symbol you were interested in trying was, you know, would actually let you work. That's fascinating. You could really mess somebody up because you know that there are characters that look like other characters. And so if you had a character here that was an O, but it was actually a different value than a normal O, I don't know. I'm going to delete that stuff. So generally, variables can be letters and numbers, but those letters can be pretty much anything that your keyboard can generate that's not a punctuation symbol, right? That's not an exclamation mark or an at sign or a pound sign or, or whatever. So the only special punctuation symbols that can be of the standard punctuation is you can support underscores. An underscore is considered a letter as far as this thing is concerned. And also dollar signs are allowed. I, I do believe that's non-standard. Otherwise, all the symbols, the standard punctuation symbols that you find on the typewriter keyboard are not considered things that can be part of variable names. Now, as part of the huge extended character sets that we have available to us, you just have to try them out if you're curious about it. Yeah, it is weird that it allows dollar sign as a variable name. I completely agree with that. So when you define a variable, you give it a type and then you give it a name. And if you feel like it, you can go ahead and list several names to create several variables at the same time. And then now that's great, but on the other hand, there is some utility in defining them one per line. And I'll give you an example why. Double hours and then pay rate and then pay, right? That's great. I got to define it just in one line, but what if I wanted to add a comment to my values as I, as I created them? So what if I had mass, force, and length, right? Well, what are the units? It might be nice if we declared this separately so that we could say this is gonna be in grams, right? And that the force is gonna be measured in Newtons. See, I'm pretending like I know what this stuff means. And then the length is gonna be measured in meters, right? You can't really tag the comment the, uh, well, you can. But what if later on I decided that no, length really should be an integer for whatever purpose, right? 
I can change that and just have to change one thing. Whereas if I had wanted to change one of these to be an integer, I'd have to cut it and put it on its own line and stuff like that. So there is some utility in listing them like that. On the other hand, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, okay, I'm going to list all of my doubles and then I'm going to list all of my, you know, ints on the next line and so on. There's absolutely nothing wrong with putting the units as part of your variable name, right? Mass in grams. Or maybe we could have just called it grams, right? Force in newtons. And then length in meters. <laughs> then that's almost too much, right? I don't think it makes it easier to read. I, th I think it makes it harder to read, right? So you get to pick. You want to call it mass. You want to call it grams. Names aren't important to the computer. They're only important to us. Do we want to call it Newtons or do we want to call it force? I'm going to go back to the way it was. And then length, I'm going to leave is that. So this dictates what kind of data can be stored in it. And the data dictates what kind of operations can be done on it. And what does that mean? What if I have a string and my name is Fred? There's certain things you can do with strings and there's certain things you can't do with strings. Numeric values like doubles and ints support, you know, plus and minus and times and division and modulus. However, strings, they do support plus. You can add two strings together if you want to. But they don't support minus, right? So string operators, you get that one. You don't get the rest of them. So if I tried to do this, you know, name equals name plus Roberts, that'll work just like it would if I was talking about one of my math values, X or whatever, right? Tax rate, whatever. They both work. X equals X plus, you know, 10. They both work. Now they have to be of compatible types, right? I cannot say name equals name plus 10 because now I'm trying to add a number to a word. That doesn't work. So the data type dictates the operators that are supported for it and what they do. And the operators can change their meaning depending upon what data type you're using. The plus sign doesn't mean add. When you're talking about strings, it means concatenate. It means, which means append. Got to give it a fancy name, concatenate. So you can't add a number to a string. If we had this, string S is equal to 10, quote 10 plus, quote 10. And then we printed that string out. Well, that didn't seem to work. S plus equals 10, right? And then if we print string out, what's it gonna print? Is it gonna print 20? No, it's not going to print 20. It's going to print 10, 10, right? Because it's not doing math. This plus equal is no longer doing math because these are not numbers. These are strings, and it's just a coincidence that something that looks like a number is part of that string. It could have been anything. It could have been the word Fred or Godzilla, right? You know, Godzilla followed by King Kong, and it would print both of those out. Whereas if you have X equals 10 and then X plus equals 10, it does equals 20. The behavior of the operator is dependent upon the type, the data type. So there are many different types of data that you will learn about. A variable holds a specific type of data. This is different than in Python. In Python, you could redeclare a variable and it would pick up its type from the data that was assigned to it. In Python, it was absolutely no problem to do something like this. Now, this is totally not C, C++, I don't even type it, but right, you could do X is equal to input and then you could do X is equal to int X and change its type completely. And at this point, it's a string and then this changes it to a number. You can't do that in this language. Once something is a string, you cannot store numeric data in it and vice versa. 
since S is declared as a string, I can't do this. S is equal to 100 without quotes because that's not a string. It's not calling it an error yet. Why is that? It's supposed to have underlined it and called it an error. Maybe if I rebuild it, it'll highlight it as an error. Sometimes it takes it a while to figure out that something's wrong. We'll make a liar out of me. Okay, once you assign S equal to 100, what happens if you print it out? S equals D. Well, that's fascinating. I don't know what it's trying to do there. I don't know how that could be a string. But the reverse is certainly not true. Since X is declared as an int, you know, I can't go X is, well, that failed. I'm just going to delete that. Anyways, but since X is an integer type, I cannot then go and set it equal to a word, right? Like that. It's definitely going to recognize that as being a syntax error. It says a value of type const can care star cannot be assigned to an entity of type int. Now it's going to take us a little bit more lecturing to get to the point where we know what a const care star is. So we're just going to have to take it on faith that this means that these are incompatible data types and that something that's declared with quotes around it cannot be stored into an int. They also can't be stored into a float, right? So I could not say double DD is equal to word, you know, whatever the word was. That's not gonna work either. They're incompatible data types. Once a variable has been given a name and a type, that's the only date, kind of data that can be stored in it. So both of those failed. So string SS, is equal to 10 or 100. That really did work. I cannot believe that. But it did not produce valid results. So these would be invalid because the data being assigned must match the, vari the declared variable type. Now, I think it's in C++. I may be wrong on this. Or maybe it's C sharp or anyways. If you use the this word, it says, I'm not going to pick the type. The compiler is supposed to pick a type that is compatible with three, for example. And so in this case, X is an int. We already had something called X, so that's a really bad choice. How about A? And an auto B is equal to Fred, right? And auto C is equal to um, 3.14159, right? Here we're just saying, uh, I'm the programmer. I'm too lazy to pick what type of data this is. So I'm going to let the compiler pick it based on what's being assigned. And since that's an int, it'll make it an int. And that's the way Python works, right? except you don't use the word auto, you just leave it off and then it reformats that variable to hold an integer or to hold a string. Now I'm sure that there are some good usage instances, to, good reasons to use that keyword rather than to explicitly give a data type. I'm not coming up with one off the top of my head so you're not gonna see me do that. Even so, once you've done that, you cannot store incompatible data in it. Right, so since C is supposed to hold floating point numbers, it can't hold strings. If I try to set C equal to B, I can't because they're not compatible data types. B cannot be copied into C because C is a double, as it's saying as I highlight my, my move my cursor over, whereas B is a string. Or actually it's a const care star. I'm gonna type that out, const care star be. That is what auto decided it was when I created it. So there's this value, this so-called literal, and when it created a variable type for it to store it into, it said that it's a constant pointer to a character. 
Well, that's that's going kind of far off the map of what we want to be talking about right now. But I'm just going to say that this is what's called an old style C string, C strings. The C programming language was invented in 1970 and C++ was a massive revision of it that was invented in the 80s. And so before C++, your strings were declared like that or in some variation of that. And then they had some uh, consequences of that, meaning that you could not change them. You could not add two strings together the way you can with two strings when we use a string data type. Let me get rid of that. So input, processing, and output. Three steps that a program typically performs. It gathers its input from the keyboard, or it could read it from files on a disk drive, you know, or you, you can have all sorts of different input devices, right? And then it processes the input data and it displays the results as output. Now, even something like a video game is constantly gathering data, processing that input, and then displaying that output. It's just that it's looping over and over and over, 60 times a second, or you know, however many, you know, whatever the frame rate of your video game is just repeating this process over and over and over, getting input, modifying data, and displaying results. So the programming process. I love this. Clearly define what the program is going to do. Visualize the program running on the computer. It sounds like Zen med uh, meditation, right? Well, I'm going to visualize the computer running on that computer. Use design tools such as hierarchy charts, flow charts, or pseudocode to model the program. Now, this is not fundamentals of programming, so we're not going to really talk about what a hierarchy chart is, and we're only going to be looking at flowcharts a little bit, and we're not going to do much pseudocode. But what is pseudocode? Pseudocode is just a way of stating logic. And if I was going to write pseudocode for the C programming language, what I'd probably do would be to write something that looked a lot like Python, <laughs> because Python and pseudocode look almost the same. And then we can convert that to the C syntax. <coughs> Check the model for logical errors. Type the code, save it, and compile it. Correct the errors. Repeat steps five and six. Run it with test data. If Make sure that it runs correctly. If there are any problems in it, then you go back, you know, as far as you need to in order to make any corrections. Validate the results of the program. So procedural versus object-oriented programming. Procedural programming is basically what we did throughout most of our Python programming, if you've done it. And it's going to be what we start off with in C++. It's where we define functions, which can be called procedures. You write your procedures and your functions, and you declare your data, and you pass data to functions, and then it does something with that data and then it processes it and then it returns so it's kind of a top-down kind of thing where it starts at the top it runs to the bottom any if statements and you know things like that and loops and fine and function calls are fine that is procedural programming object oriented programming is a whole nother bag that expands upon the ideas of procedural programming but it treats data as though they are things what do I need to know about this well I have an employee I have an employee object. Well, every employee has a name and a birth date and a state of residence and a social security number, visa number, or whatever, right? And so you list things by attributes. You create an object and you list its attributes, which are the values that it can have. And we will get there. We certainly will get there, but it's not how we're going to start from day one. Day one, we're going to treat this as a, we're a procedural programming language where we declare our discrete data values and we do some math on them and we get input and we display results and we may have some function calls in there as well. I really wish it would let me know. Is it accepting string as 100 because of ASCII values? Yeah, I, I considered that for a moment and then I discarded it. And it's actually correct if we think about it. I bet if we looked up the ASCII value of 100, it's the letter D, lowercase d. So ASCII table.com. Yep, 
Yep, yep. So you nailed it. When I said it equal to a number, when I said that string was equal to 100, it said it equal to D. If I'd said it equal to the number 35, it would have been, it would have printed out as a hash, a pound sign. It's trippy that it'll do that. Interesting. Very good. Very good. You nailed it. And I just realized you can't see the chat messages when they come up on my screen and I display them like that. So I wish I could click a button that would show you the chat message. And, and the message was, is why did that come up being D? It's because it's taking that 100 and it's converting it to an ASCII character, which is a lowercase D. And that's why when we printed that out, it printed out as the letter D. Would not work in Java or a great many programming languages, but the C syntax is, is interesting in what it considers things to be compatible with each other. In an awful lot of languages, if you type this in, int um, number equals 3.3, .3, it flat out would not compile because this is a floating point type and this is an integer. And so languages like Java would go, no, you can't do that. And C++ says, yeah, no problem. I'll go ahead and do it, but I'll just round it out. And so if I printed a number, it would print three. It would ignore everything after the decimal point. So I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that it does it that way. Um, just means that it's, the compiler does not do the same kind of error checking that some compilers do to try to prevent you from making mistakes. Now, maybe it's fine. Maybe I don't mind 3.3 .3 being rounded down as it's being stored into an int. It would be kind of nice if it warned me, if it flagged it as an error, or at least as a warning. But when I run it, I believe if I look at the error list, yeah, no issues found. It totally did not care that that data is getting lost, right? Oh, well. <laughs> other compilers and other languages do care. So I believe we're at the last thing. I don't even usually offer quizzes over chapter one. If I did put a quiz over chapter one, it would basically be to do something like this and then ask you to list the identifiers and then the operators and then the keywords. So, Maybe I ought to do that, but I'm not going to write up a quiz right now. But if we were looking at our code and we saw this, int number is equal to three, you know, and then int number two is equal to number times, you know, 10. And then I highlighted those two lines and I said list the keywords. I'm going to change that data type to double. So list the keywords, list the identifiers, list the operators. Oh, come on. And list the so called literals. Well, I'm just going to do those one by one. Keywords. We have two keywords that kind of jump out at us. Int and double. Let's see identifiers. Number and number two. Those are identifiers. Let's see operators. Those are the symbols, not counting the punctuation, which are the semicolons and the commas. So we use the equal operator and we used the asterisk. Those were our operators. And then the literals. The literals are the values that are hard coded into the program, that are typed into the program, not entered by the user at runtime, but actually coded directly into the program. And so in this case, we have two literals. We've got that, 
and we've got that. These are numeric literals. They're also called unnamed constants. This is an unnamed constant because nothing's going to change the value of that three without me actually opening the source code and editing it and changing it. So literals are just values that are literally typed into the source code of the program. Some people call them magic numbers because it can be a mystery as to why somebody had that number there. So if you had this, if number is greater than 800, then call the error function, right? You would look and you go, why in the world? What is 800? Eight, why can't it be greater than 800? That's a magic number. Just looking at it, we have no idea what it means, right? But what if we had a good name for that, right? What if we had pound sign defined um, maximum graphic handles, right? As 800. And then we would probably have put that up at the top of our code. Anyways, there. Now, if the number is greater than the max graphic handles, right now, we may not know what a max graphic handle is, but we have a lot better chance of understanding what this little snippet of code is checking than if it just said if number is greater than 800. So we took that magic number and we made it a macro definition. Or we could have defined it as a constant. Const int max graphic handles equals 800 semicolon. Like that, right? Either way. So now it's not an unnamed constant. It's a named constant, right? But we got rid of the, gra of the magic number. Magic numbers can be confusing because if you look at the source and you see a number embedded in the code and you don't know where it came from or what it means, it's that completely devoid of context, then it's a magic number. Another reason to avoid magic numbers is what if we had this check throughout our code over and over and over, if number is greater than this 800 and later on we had another check, right? While number less than 800 and Later on, we decided that we could have more than 800 open graphic handles. You'd have to go through your source code and find every location of 800 and change it, right? We've revised our, our algorithms and now we can support 1,000 graphic handles. You'd have to go and find all instances of that 800 and update them to 1,000 and make sure you get them all. Whereas if it's declared as a named constant like that, or as a pound defined definition, then you just change it in one place. And then every, and so if we changed our graphic max handles to a thousand, then it would trickle through and it will change everywhere that referred to it by its name. So we try to avoid magic numbers. If you have magic numbers in the middle of your code, your, your unnamed literals, unless it's just absolutely obvious what it means, then the number should probably be assigned to a constant variable or to a uh, macro definition. How did I get off on that topic? Good question. By the way, when you want to jump to the next line, there's two ways of forcing a next line. One is you can use E and DL, like I've done occasionally up here, or you can use backslash N like that. And you'll see me switch between doing the, the, the and there's no, really no reason to do one over the other, except if I've already got an open quote, it's easier for me just to add backslash in, right? And that means go to the next line. Whereas if I don't have an open quote, like when I was printing this out, then I would have to open a quote and then do backslash in and then close quote, right? So, if I'm not in the middle of a quote and I want to go to the next line, I use E and DL. If I am in the middle of a quote and I want to go to the next line, if I have an open quote going on, then I'll just tack on slash in. Either work just fine. They absolutely do the same thing. Okay, I know why I got off on that. Because I was talking about key keywords, identifiers, operators, and the literals. The literals are the unnamed constants. also called unnamed constants. 
as to differentiate them from named constants like that, right? That's a named constant. So here, that's a literal, that's a literal, believe it or not. It's an unnamed constant, it's a string literal, right? It's a character literal. Same for that, right? All your output text is typically unnamed literals. I'm not gonna go in to create a different pound to find for each text message that I'm gonna print. Although if you're creating something that's supposed to be used in multiple languages, then you might wanna think about storing your output in the variables so that then you could create tables so that it could be translated easily from one language to another. And you know, you pick a language for your program and then it changes all of the locations, right? All the values, the string values to be displayed. All right, so we are at the end of the chapter, but before we go any further, I want to go ahead and define some pseudocode and then have us write a program that matches it. And the pseudocode is gonna look a lot like Python. So let me bring up a text editor of some kind. Heck, I'll just write it down here at the end of my code here. So pseudocode for pay, let me open a comment. So I'm gonna do a slash star to create a multi-line comment. And that means that I can just keep typing on and on and on without it being considered syntax errors. And then it will need to end in a star slash. Okay, pseudocode for pay calculator. We're gonna input the hours worked. We're going to input the pay rate. And we are gonna do this as time and a half. So we're gonna have to make our algorithm support that. And then so the pay will equal the hours worked times the pay rate, and then if hours worked is greater than 40, then we're going to calculate a bonus, which is equal to the hours worked minus 40, right? So any time over 40, times the pay rate, divided by two. That's how you get time and a half, and there's more than one way of calculating time and a half, and I've had people argue, um, argue with me, saying that's not how you calculate time and a half, because they know darn well how to do it, and their way is valid, but this is another valid way as well. And so, just take it on faith, and if you wanted to code it the other way, or one of several other ways of calculating time and a half bonus pay, they work as well. Okay, and then we would want to output, well, then we would need to add. So why don't we set our variables? What are our variables? We're gonna need several variables. We're gonna need a variable called hours worked, a variable called pay rate, and a variable called pay, and a variable called bonus, and a variable called total, because the total is equal to the pay plus the bonus but the bonus might be zero. So our variables, we're gonna need one called hours worked, pay rate, pay, bonus, and total. And we're absolutely gonna need to initialize bonus to zero, or we could just say, if something is equal to that, then the bonus is equal to that, else the bonus is equal to zero. It'll work either way. But there's nothing wrong with creating our variables and setting them all equal to zero if we want to. So that's the pseudocode for our, for our program. It's not exactly, you know, Python, but we could change this into Python pretty much. And we're not telling the user, I mean, we're not telling the programmer what messages to display on the screen. We're not gonna output the bonus. We're just gonna output the total. We might make it more complicated than that and just tell them what their base pay was, plus the bonus and then the total or we could just output the total. That's the program that I want us to write using C++.
And I wish I could keep this on the screen and Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Then we'll take a little break before we hit the next chapter. All right. I know you can't see that, but this <laughs> could make the font a little bit bigger. All right. So I want to write a program that does that. Now I could just start a brand new project, right? I wouldn't necessarily have to add it to this one. I'm going to pretend I'm doing that by renaming this one to main two or old main. That means that this stuff is no longer part of any important program at all. I'm starting fresh. So I created a program. I'm starting off. I need to define main and it needs to return zero at the end of it. And now I'm ready to go. I'm going to try to create a program that matches the logic shown over there in my little text file. So we need some variables. Here's our declarations. I'm just going to make them all double floating point types. I could just call it hours rather than hours work. <laughs> and then I just could call it rate, but not pay rates a good enough word. And then pay, maybe I should call that base. I'm just gonna call it pay, pay, and then bonus, and then total. And I'm gonna initialize them all to zero as we go. All right, now we need to input the hours work. So C out, less than, less than. How many hours did you work this week? Space, space, greater than, end quote, semicolon. It's just a personal quirk that I like to use, a greater than symbol to tell them where to type. Now I'm gonna let them type in the data, so I'm gonna use CIN, greater than, greater than, hours. So we have taken care of this line, input hours worked. Now I'm going to input the pay rate. Same business, I'm going to have a question and then let them type it in. And the act of displaying a question and letting them type it in is called prompting the user. So see out less than less than. What do you earn per hour? space space greater than end quote semicolon cin greater than greater than pay rate so this stage of the program is getting input i'm adding comments to describe the general blocks of logic in the code all right so now that we have those two things we can start doing our, our calculations Calculate pay. So the pay is equal to the hours times the hourly pay. So pay hours times pay rate. But then we have this conditional logic where if our hours worked is greater than 40, then we get a bonus. If hours underscore worked greater than 40, now that's a magic number, isn't it? But I've never known that to be changed, right? Never known anybody to offer time and a half for like more than 30 hours a week. So I'm going to, I'm comfortable leaving it. I don't know why I said hours worked here. Why is that underlined? Oh, because I just called it hours. All right. So if hours 
is greater than 40. Then our bonus is equal to hours minus 40 in parentheses times pay rate divided by two. I'm gonna leave off the else. It's not necessary as long as that variable got initialized to zero up here. I guess there wouldn't be anything wrong with doing it. Else bonus is equal to zero. And so let's calculate our total. Total is equal to pay plus the bonus. And then let's display our results. I'm gonna go ahead and expand this now. Don't need this stuff in the background. I'm gonna take this out because it's just wasting space on the screen. I shrunk it just a little bit. If that's too small, if that's too small to read, let me know. I can bump it back up. Okay, so C out, less than less than. Base pay equals dollar sign, end quote, less than less than pay, less than less than ENDL. See out less and less than overtime bonus equals dollar sign end quote less and less than bonus less and less than ENDL see out less and less than quote total earned equals dollar sign end quote less and less than total less and less in India. All right, so that's my program. I wish I could get it all on one screen, but it's not gonna quite fit on one screen unless I remove all the blank lines. Well, there, we just about got it all on one page. If I deleted one blank line, it would fit. <laughs> all right. There we go, that's my program. Let's run it and see what happens. There were build errors, probably because of that business about renaming main to old main and stuff like that. Gotta get my error list up and running. Oh, it's all this stuff in old main. And old main must return a value. All right, yeah. Yeah, maybe shouldn't have done it that way. Anyways, I am gonna fix that error. And if you did the same exact thing as I did, if you made a function called old main and you put a bunch of that sample code in it, then make sure that the last statement of it is return zero. It's another quirk of Microsoft that you can get away with not having a return statement on main. And it'll just insert mentally and behind the scenes a return zero. But we should be putting that return statement explicitly. And I remember to do it when I created my brand new one, right? But I did not. I think that will do. All right, so if I work 50 hours a week at $10 per hour, the base pay is 500, but time and a half got me an extra $50 for a total of 550. And does that make sense? Yeah, because I had 10 extra hours, or 10 hours over 40, and I got a half bonus for those, and so half of 10 is five, and so 10 times five is 50. Okay, so that seems to be a valid solution.
All right. So if you're trying to get this to work, I'm going to give you a minute or two to do so. Let's take a five minute break before we come back. And if you've got problems with your code, maybe we can figure out how to do the screen sharing because I know that it's enabled so that I can look at your code and spot any problems in it. Let's at least give that a shot. Worst comes to worst, you could text me, you know, pictures of your, <laughs> of your code and I can tell you what line number the error is on. But uh, so I'm going to pause the recording for now. I certainly hope that I remember to resume it when we actually begin the lecture proper. And so I'll be back in five minutes at 8.55. So what's the difference between what we have done here and what we have done in prior Python classes if you've taken them? Well, the big difference is that we had to declare our variables before we use them, or at least we had to assign data types to them. You don't have to declare them beforehand. I could have skipped declaring pay, for example, and just declared it right on the fly, right? But I did have to have hours declared before I could store into it. Right, I could not do cin arrow arrow double arrows. Right, you know I cannot create the variable as data is being inserted into it. So that one had to be declared beforehand. Pay rate had to be declared beforehand. Total did not. We could have left this definite, and I'm not recommending you make these changes. And I'm going to undo them pretty soon. Right. So you don't have to declare all your variables in one lump up at the top. On the other hand, there's nothing wrong with doing that, especially if you need to add comments to them, you know, what, what each one wants. In this case, we tried to pick variable names that were good enough so that we could kind of have a concept of what they were. But, you know, probably I should have declared them all separately and added a comment to, you know, saying what each variable was. So this works just as well, but I'm gonna undo it. Why not have all the variables up? And top. If I did want to add comments, I could do this. I could just break them out like that. And then I could put slash slash. Whoops. Hours worked this week. Hourly pay. Right. Base pay before bonus. Bonus calculated as time and a half, and then total pay. Right. There we go. Maybe it's kind of cheesy to line up the comments like that. Maybe not. It did. It let me declare them all with just one keyword rather than having to use the word double in front of every single one of these. So whether you consider that an advantage or not, whatever. All right, let's go to the next chapter. Why did I go to chapter five? That's being a little bit aggressive. Why don't we get to the correct chapter? Two, that sounds a lot better. So the parts of a C++ program, these are comments. There's two kinds of comments. There's a comment that begins with two slashes, and then there are the comments where you mark off a whole bunch of code with a slash star and then end them up with a star slash. At one time, that was the only comment that the language supported. And so anytime you wanted to add a single line comment like that, you would wind up doing this, you know name of that and so then people you know customize their c compilers to allow single line comments 
and it eventually became part of the language. Anyways, let's uh, go back to that. These are single line comments, and the others, the star slash slash star ones, are multi line comments. And then we have our preprocessor directive, brings in the contents of that file so that to give our language extra capabilities. And then using namespace std, without that, we would have to put std colon colon in front of a lot of things. This just says, okay, we're gonna go ahead and dictate that if that was necessary, it no longer is. And we don't have to do it that way. And then we have our function definition here. We have a code block begin curly brace. And we have an output statement and we have a return statement. And then we have a closed curly brace. Now, why is this program returning a zero? When we use Python, we did not return a value from our program. But when this program runs, once the executable is created, let me do that. I'm gonna run it, which will build the executable, or I could just choose, you know, project rebuild. See here, it's an executable, lecture b.exe. I could go and find that if I wanted to. All right, so maybe it's in the debug folder. Here's my executable right here, and I can run it from the command prompt. And now it's asking me the questions. How many hours did you work this week? Of course, you can't see that because it's almost microscopic text. Let me see what I can do about that. All right. There we go. So how many hours did I work this week? I worked 100 hours. I was a busy man. How much do I earn an hour? 100. All right. And so anyways, and then when the program ran, it returned a zero to the operating system. Now, if I had run that program from a batch file, a CMD file, a script file, or from another program, that batch file or that script file, or that CMD file, or that calling program could check what was returned. And quite often people say that if it's a zero, it's a success. If the program returns a zero, it did not fail. And if it returns a non-zero value, then it was a failure. And so then you can have a whole bunch of different error values defined so that, oh, if my program returns a 10, it means that it crashed because it ran out of file space. And if it returns a 20, anyways. So that is why main is defined as being as having a return type so that it can return a value back to the operating system now we not probably aren't going to do anything with that we're probably not going to write code that checks the return value of another program that runs but we could so special characters Slash slash, it's a comment, a pound sign, a hash. If you ever really want to annoy somebody, you can insist on calling it Octothorpe. Octothorpe. <laughs> this is, that's a word made up by the phone company when they decided to put that symbol on the uh, keyboard of your, of your touchtone phone back in the 40s or 50s or whenever they were invented. They needed a, uh, to refer to that in their documentation, and so they use the word octo, meaning eight. I guess there's eight lines involved. One, two, three, four, five, six. No, there's not. I don't know how they came up with it. Pound sign. Begins a preprocessor directive. Less than and greater thans do the file names for pound sign include, but then they also can be used like this as stream insertion operators to get data to the screen or from the screen. Open and close parentheses, group data together in a function call. Curly braces and close a group of statements to define a block of code. Double quotes, create a string of characters and a semicolon ends a program statement. So the see out object displays output on the screen. 
see out less and less and programming is fun. You can send more than one item to the screen like this, see out, hello, and then arrow, arrow there. And that would print out, hello there. And it would print it out all in one line because there's no backslash in and then there's no ENDL. So the results would be hello there. That would be what would be displayed on the screen. Or you could do that as two separate statements, right? See out hello, semicolon. See out there, semicolon. So it's not like the Python print statement. You remember Python print always goes to the next line unless you go to the effort of telling it not to. By default, it does go to the next line. See out does not by default go to the next line. So if you ever wanted to go to the next line, you better tack on your backslash in or you better send an ENDL to it. That would get it to go to the next line. So this is one line of output. Programming is fun. If we did not have that space there, then when it ran, it would say programming is fun, right? So that's why we'd put that space there or we would put it there, one or the other. The ENDL manipulator, I love that name, manipulator. ENDL just signifies that we're trying to go to the next line of output. So this will produce two lines of output. Programming is, end of line, fun. It's still not correct. We'd want to go to the end of line after this one as well too, because otherwise the cursor is going to be left blinking after the statement programming is fun. And then the cursor is just going to be left there, right? We probably don't want that. So we would probably want to put an ENDL here as well, in my opinion. Then it would have gone to the next line. Whoops. The slash in escape sequence. Well, what is an escape sequence? When the computer is displaying text, if it finds a backslash, the one above the return key, not underneath the question mark, it skips out of normal text display modes and enters a special mode where its behavior is dependent upon the thing that follows the backslash in. The most common one is backslash in. It's a control character. That means go to the next line. But there are other ones as well. The other most common one is T backslash T for tab. You want to tab over to the next column. And so this would print out programming is and then go to the next line and then print fun. The include directive inserts the contents of another file into the program during the pre-processing stage. So it's a direct pre-processor directive. It's not part of the C++ language. However, every C++ compiler comes bundled with the preprocessor to enable that kind of stuff. They were developed hand in hand. And so the pound sign include line is actually removed from the resulting code that the preprocessor produces before the compiler runs. And so don't put a semicolon at the end of the pound sign include file. It might not cause it to fail, but then it again, it might. It's not a C line, so you don't need to put semicolons at the end of it. Preprocessing is its own language. Variables and literals. A variable is a storage location in memory. It has a name and a type of data that it can hold. Or just like I said earlier, every variable has a name, its identifier, a type, a value, and a memory address. And the variable must be defined before it can be used. Example, INT item. And a literal. A literal is a value that is written into the program's code. Hello there, or 12, right? We've talked about literals already. Apples equals 20. That's an unnamed constant. It's an integer literal. It's literally typed into the code. Today we sold a certain number of apples, bushels of apples. These are string literals. 
identifiers. Identifiers are programmer-defined names for parts of a program, like the variable names or the function names or the class names. Our C++ keywords. This text is very small, but you can see that there's about 70, 70 or 80 different predefined reserved keywords. So we cannot pick our variable names to match these, but that's not usually a, a, a problem. Usually I don't feel like creating a variable called auto or break or not, or anyways. You can see that there's a whole bunch of stuff here and we're not gonna know what some of these mean even after the class is done, but that's okay. We're gonna learn the base portion of the language and then you could always just grab the operator, excuse me, the keyword list and Google up one a day to learn what the rest of them are. But while we're talking about it, let's look up what size of does. It's actually a function, so I'm not sure why they're saying that it's a keyword, but it is part of the language. What size of does is it tells you how many bytes is occupied by a piece of data. So for example, if I do this, C out less than less than size of pay in parentheses equals, oh, come on. End quote, less than, less than, size of parentheses, pay in parentheses, less than, less than MDL. It's gonna tell me how many bytes the pay variable occupies. And it's gonna be eight. Because variables of type double, double wide floating point, occupy eight bytes. Whereas if they were an int, if I replace that with int, occupies four bytes. Right? And so an integer holds four bytes to hold its data. A double holds eight bytes. A so-called float, which is a single wide floating point, not a double wide, occupies four bytes. A long long, which is a long version of the integer, occupies eight. And there are other variable types we could try out. You can see the list right here. Where did my PowerPoint go? Did I accidentally close it? Looks like I did. No, I didn't. Oh, it's right there. Okay, anyways, there are other data types. Short. That's a short it that uses two bytes rather than four to hold an integer. So this maximum size of a short is much smaller than a maximum size of a normal int. A variable name should represent the purpose of the variable. Items ordered, for example. That's a much better variable name than just calling it IO, right? <laughs> or even worse, I. The purpose of the variable is obviously to hold the number of items ordered. So the first letter of the identifier must either be a letter or an underscore. Although as we saw last hour, its definition of letter is somewhat flexible. <laughs> After the first character, you can use other alphabet characters or numbers or underscore characters. It is case sensitive, so uppercase and lowercase characters are distinct. So total sales, that's a valid variable. Total underscore sales, that's also valid. Total dot sales, no, that's not a valid variable name. Fourth quarter sales, is that valid? No, because of that digit. Total sale dollar sign, no, cannot contain a dollar sign. Okay, you see what I mean? Microsoft is non-standard and does support it. So that slide is wrong, that this book is not written to be Microsoft specific. 
integer data types. We have a lot of different data types we can use. In Python, we just created a variable and we stored a number in it and we didn't really care much about it beyond that. Well, C's gets a lot more particular than that. There's the int. Four bytes are used to hold an int and so it can hold a value from about negative two billion to positive two billion. And someday we'll get into why, you know, what, a, what is a byte? It's a collection of eight bits. And if you've taken my fundamentals course, you already know how bits and bytes interact with each other. But the more bits you have, the larger the numbers you can hold, which is why a 64-bit operators operating system is better than a 32-bit one. The uh, values of the numbers and the amount of memory it can address and the size of the hard drive it can address are larger. So an int can hold that, whereas a long, long int can hold a much larger one because it's an eight byte data type. And one thing that's of interest is that these data type sizes that are listed here are not declared by a standard. Meaning that if you write a program and use a Linux compiler, you use Clang or something like that, or you compile it on uh, with a Mac compiler, it's going to say that a long int is eight bytes, whereas Microsoft decided that a long int is four bytes. And it's kind of unfortunate that they did that, and I have no idea why Microsoft made that choice, because then it means that if you want to make a great big number, you have to repeat the word long. You have to call it a long, long int. But anyways, so an eight byte data type will hold much larger numbers. It's not limited to two billion. It's, you know, nine super quadzillion, whatever that is. You know, I don't really know. A short int is one that can only go from negative 32,000 to positive 32,000. If your number is only going to hold positive values, you can add the keyword unsigned to its data type. Because if our number doesn't need to ever go negative, by adding unsigned to it, we've extended, we've doubled the maximum size of data that can be stored in it. Because if we don't have to go negative, then this variable, an int, can hold up to four billion. Otherwise, if it has to support a negative sign, if it has to be able to go positive or negative, then half of it you know, is below the zero, and then half of it is above the zero, so you get from negative two billion to positive two billion. But if it's unsigned, then you get zero up to twice that, which is four billion. Same for long, long, right? Long, long is a signed data type that goes from negative nine super quadzillion to positive nine super quadzillion. Again, I made that up. Whereas an unsigned version of it can't go negative, so it can go from zero to 18 super duper quadzillion. A short can go from negative 32,000 to positive 32,000, but if you make it an unsigned short, then it can't go negative, but it can go to twice as large as large a value. And the reason it does that is because if you have a negative number, it, that is supported by setting the first bit of a byte equal to one, and if that is set to one, it's called the sign bit. And so if that sign bit is zero, you treat it as though it's a positive number. And if you treat it as, if it's a one, then you treat it as a negative number. But that one bit is part of your possible data, right? And so if you say, I, no, I wanna use all the bits in this to represent data, and I don't care about whether the first one is a positive or a negative, meaning that it's negative or positive, then it can hold data that's twice as large. So you can declare your variables on separate lines like that, or you can define multiple variables on the same line. So this program has variables of several of the integer types. Checking. Our checking account balance is an int. Now our checking account balance can go negative, so we did not make it an unsigned int. Honestly, I never use the word unsigned. You know, its benefit is that you could get large, slightly larger values, but meh. And then 
our distance traveled? Well, we can't travel a negative amount of distance, so they decided that our mileage variable should be declared as unsigned. And in diameter, well, diameter is supposed to be a really big number, so they declared it as a long. But as we saw on this slide up here, making it a long did not improve its capability because a long int and a normal int in Microsoft C are the same data type. But in Macintosh C, in Linux C, in, in GNU, GNU C, you know, they are different. A long is an eight byte data type. So I don't know why they did that. This example should have said long, long if it was going to Microsoft C, which they seem to be indicating by that. Integer literals, checking, I have negative $20 in my checking account. I wanna check something. The C Sharp compiler, which is a different version of C, let you do something odd. Int checking equals I have $23,000 in my checking account. Oh, it doesn't like that dot because it's a uh, int. Okay, yeah, double. Non-identifier character in use. Okay, so that's a quirk of some languages. C++ does not support it. Um, if you have a really large number, you know, like that, then some languages, and C++ is not one of them, so I shouldn't have even mentioned it, but if you ever see that written out, use the underscore like people use commas when they're writing numbers out by hand, right? So that you can tell the difference between thousands and millions and billions. But this language doesn't support that, so never mind. So integer literals, all the literals in a program are defined as ints by default. If it's an integer, if it's not a string and if it doesn't have a decimal point, that it's an int. So all three of these are int literals. What if the number needed to be larger than an int? What if it needed to be larger than two billion? Then uh, when you create it, you have to add a suffix to it to indicate that it's a long or a long, long. So let's say that I'm incredibly rich and that my checking account is equal to $2 trillion, a trillion. Well, if a billion has nine zeros, a trillion has 12 zeros. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. But that's way bigger than 2 billion, which is the maximum of literal, the, the maximum value of an integer, since all integer literals are, are just ints, unless you add the suffix. And there we go. Right. Now, it's possible that the compiler is going to try to make a, a go of it and treat it correctly anyways like that. Notice that when I move my cursor over it, it says, oh, that's a long, long. And it is. It knew that uh, the compiler is trying to, to be helpful to us, and it's saying that I know that number's too big to be an integer, so I'm gonna go ahead and make it a long, long. But if your compiler was producing an error when you tried to compile it and complaining that that was too large to be an integer, then you would tack on LL to make it work. Or you could express it in scientific notation, right? 2e to the 12, right? <laughs> That's two trillion, the same thing. There's other suffixes you can use as well. There's one F for floating point. Now, I don't really recommend we ever use the F one for floating point because I don't want us to use floats 
floats are a less precise form of floating point type than double. And any floating point literal in your code is already assumed to be a double. And it's already assumed to be a floating point, so you don't have to do anything like this. Um, double the weight is equal to 3023F, right? That's a floating point number. Well, then. It's interesting. Let's pretend I'm not even talking about that right now because I don't know why I did that. Let's go back and look. All right. So if it's a long line, you're supposed to put LL at the end of it. If it's a base 16 number, you prefix it with 0x. So if it's a hexadecimal number, int number is equal to you know, 2AA, well, that's a hexadecimal value. We would have to prefix it with 0x to make that work. And then there's something called octal. Octal is a counting system where there's no eights or nines. There's only the digits zero through seven. And so if you stick a zero in front of your number, it's treated as an octal number. And it's a good thing that we don't normally write our numbers like that because that could actually cause us problems, right? Like if I said that, okay, there. I'm gonna put 100 into that number. Well, if I write that number out, it's not equal to 100, as you and I think of 100. That is 100 as expressed in octal. I don't even remember what that is. Is it 50? Let's find out. Yeah, 64. Okay. So don't ever put leading zeros in your literals like that unless you absolutely know what you're trying to do. The little helper here is telling me that O100 is equal to the integer value of 64. <coughs> Excuse me. Search online. Huh. All right, guess I could learn, read that up and learn something. Interesting that it offered me the option to search online for something about it. I don't even know what search what it did for. Okay, C++ int num. Cool. The care data type. Everything that the computer handles is a number, including text. Like when we went to ASCIItable.com and we found out that the number 100 was equal to a lowercase d, that's because the letters have to be represented as numbers to be stored in computer's memory. And a single byte is large enough to hold a character. And so you can create a data type that's customized to hold letters and use the care data type. And when you assign a character, you use either single quotes or you just give it a numeric value, which is the ASCII value of it. And so in my code, I could do character first initial equals single quote J in single quote, right? I have to use single quotes. Unlike Python, I can't just swap in singles and doubles whenever I feel like it. Double quote always means string, single quote always means single character in this language and in a great many others. So how about my last initial? Well, let's say that my last initial is also J, but I'm gonna assign it by It's ASCII value. So a capital J is a 74. So I could just set it equal to 74. Or I could use a hexadecimal value of 4A. Right. Or OX4A. Right. And so then if I printed out my initials, see out my initials are followed by the first initial. Let's 
followed by the last initial, followed by the NBO. It'll print out my initials or JJ. It's getting tedious having to answer these questions over and over. There we go, my initials are JJ. So a letter is just a number. And we know what would happen if I put 100 there, then they would say that my last initial was a lowercase d. So character literals are when we have a single quote followed by a single letter. All you can do is put one letter in there. If there were more than one letter in it, it would not be a character literal. And if it did not count it as a syntax error, it would only take the first one. So character strings. If you do this, if you say A is equal to hello, then behind the scenes, what is stored? A series of bytes, letters for, oh no Siri, I am not talking to you. A sequence of bytes, each byte containing one letter, and then terminated by a zero to indicate that that is the end of the string. So when I said A is equal to hello, behind the screen, in the scenes, it's got these five letters, these five values, plus a zero at the end. So I'm not going to go and look up what the ASCII values of H E L L and O are, but you can imagine, right? You know, it's going to be like the 66 and then 101 and then 108 and 108 and 109 or whatever. And then there would be a zero there at the end. It is about time to stop here. So what are we going to do? Well, we've seen the idea of writing programs that take input and perform a calculation on it and do some output. So we're just gonna have some simple programming problems. If I want to use the value of pi, I can do that because my program has this up at the top, use math defines. So if I wanted to ask the user for the radius of a circle and to calculate the diameter and the area of the circle, I can do that. So problem, ask the user for the radius of a circle and calculate and display the circumference and volume, not volume, area. Let's do that. We're going to need a variable to hold those things. We're going to need variables to hold the radius and circumference and area. So double radius, comma, circumference, and then area. So let's ask, see out, what is the radius of the circle? Let's let them type it in. CIN greater than greater than radius. Now let's do our calculation or calculations, right? The area of the circle is pi r squared. So m underscore pi, which I got because of this use math defines. times the radius squared. So POW radius comma two. And that is area equals pi r squared. So I'm, I'm gonna add some comments. But I'll do that after the next calculation, which is that the circumference is two pi r. Circumference equals two times pi 
times radius. Note, these calculations need the CMath include and the define usernames. All right, and then we can print those out. C out. The area is less and less than area. And the circumference is in quote less and less in circumference, less and less in the deal. Now, unfortunately, it's going to do all the rest of this stuff as well, but I'm just going to live with it. I'm going to put a system parentheses quote pause here, which is a cheating way of preventing the program from getting any further, but it only works on Windows, not a Mac compatible statement. But if we run it, there were build errors. Better look at my error list. Sometimes you can see it. I see a red mark right here. Circum is undefined. That's because I called it circumf. And then it's giving me a warning here about a loss of data, but that's because I was, I guess POW returns a floating point value. So it's returning a double and then storing it into an int. At least it's giving me a warning telling me that that's not a good idea. But if I wanted to fix that, I would need to make int a double rather than int because POW is returning a floating point. That's why I got that one as well. But I don't have to fix a warning. All right, so what's the radius of the circle? 10. And so the area is 314 and the circumference is 62. Looks good to me. All right, so based on that idea, our homework is going to be to do a couple little things like that. Ask the user for a number of miles and convert and display or calculate and display the number of kilometers. Now, let's get the conversion ratio for that. One mile in kilometers. Okay, so that's our formula. The formula is kilometers is equal to miles times that. Also, let's do another one. Ask the user for the temperature in Fahrenheit. Calculate and display the temperature in Celsius. And I'll give you the formula for that as well. The formula is temperature C is equal to temperature in F minus 32 in parentheses divided by 1.8. I think that's right. You know, I guess I better try it out. The way that I always check these in my head is 
32 degrees F is zero C. So is this gonna make zero if I type in 32 there? 32 minus 32 divided by 1.8 is zero, so that's correct. And 212 F is equal to 100 C. So 212 minus 32 is 180 divided by 1.8 is 100. Okay, so that's a correct, that's a correct formula. And then ask the user for a number of pounds, convert and display the equivalent number of ounces. There are, is it 16 pounds per ounce? What? One pound in ounces, 16, okay. All right, so just three problems. You don't have to write three separate programs, just write one program that, you know, asks for three pieces of data and displays the three results that you want. Write a program that does the following three tasks. That makes sense? So I'll make a Dropbox for that. And of course, we will have a Dropbox for the lecture as well, which I'll go ahead and go and do. If there aren't any questions, I'm going to stop the recording, but I'm not going to stop the Zoom meeting yet while I go and open those up. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.